before we get started, just so you guys know, my name is Hector Vidigo. I'm the Senior Vice President of Admissions here at Academy of Art University in San Francisco. Uh, thank you all so much for spending your Tuesday night here with us. Uh, we're super excited to have you. Uh, tonight should be a lot of fun. Uh, once again, uh, what, we're, uh, what we're focusing on tonight is jewelry making, creating a beautiful bracelet. Uh, we have uh, in the house tonight helping us out and running this is our online coordinator, Karen Chesna. So before we go into our workshop, let me just uh, take a quick minute to throw a few things out there in the chat for everybody. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and drop my email. I'll be your host tonight. Uh, you may also be hearing from Reed Rocker. He's our uh, Senior Director of Admissions as well. Very knowledgeable about our programs. I'm going to go ahead and put my email in there. I would love for every one of you to go ahead and send me an email as soon as you can. Uh, just shoot me an email. A lot of students want to talk and, and have questions and dialogue back and forth. So uh, feel free to shoot me that email so that we can stay in touch. Also, uh, Karen is going to be supplying us with a supply list of the materials used tonight. So if you want me to send you out that supply list, she has a range of different materials from high-end stuff to things that are more budgeted. This way I can make sure I can get that stuff over to you all. Also, one thing I wanna mention is this week right now is Animation and Visual Effects Industry Week. We have different events going on every single night. Our students have actually been working on professional films with directors and actors in Hollywood. Check out the registration link, it's free. Uh, but we are gonna have not only our students, but actually actors and uh, directors and people that are actually in mainstream media right now, they're gonna be participating. So we have a really cool lineup for that. So please feel free to check that out if you can jump in there. Uh, I think it'll be really worth your time this week. Also, just for a quick second to promote next week's event. Next week is going to be a really fun event called Behind the Scenes, creating a live talent show competition remotely with Jan Yanahiro. Uh, this is going to be same time, same place, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can go ahead and RSVP for that one as well. Uh, so if you guys don't know Jan, she has been uh, on, she has been uh, the director of our communications program here for quite a while, uh, but also Jan has a long, uh, awesome career working in the broadcast industry. So it's, it's pretty cool to, to, to work with somebody that's been doing this for a living. So um, last but not least, I wanna introduce, before we get to Karen, I wanna make sure I introduce Reed Rocker. He's our Senior Director of Admissions. So uh, he may be stepping in a little bit here to talk in detail about our program. So without further ado, let me go ahead and move over to Karen here. So a little bit about Karen. Once again, she's our online coordinator here in the Jewelry Metal Arts program. A native of Chicago, Karen earned her MFA in Sculpture Metals from the Academy of Art University here and holds a BA in History of Art and Architecture with a concentration on Indigenous Art from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She spent many years working in the Anthropology Department of the Field Museum of Natural History and considers this a major influence on her sculptural jewelry, artist books, and small metal-based mixed media sculptures. Karen owns and operates Glacier Metal Art Studio in Missoula, Montana, where she lives and where she teaches metal smithing to students of all skill levels. So live from Missoula, Montana right now, I'm gonna hand it over here to Karen. And Karen, feel free to go ahead and take it away. Okay, so we are talking bracelets tonight, as you all probably know. And um, there are many different kinds of bracelets. Um, all the skills that we teach in the gem classes at the academy are, um, you know, covered in these. But um, and bracelets can run from very simple, uh, just uh, you know, a little tiny piece that's stamped, to something much more elaborate with a lot of set stones, a lot of mass. Um, this is another kind with a lot of texture. It's a technique called fusing that put the texture on, all these little pieces are bonded. And these take a lot of time and a lot of skill, but we do teach you how to do this kind of thing in your gem classes. But um, for, so for tonight though, we, um, we're gonna talk about how to make a, a simple file bracelet using very few tools. And bracelets are great because they're, they're nice gifts and they sell well at craft fairs because they don't take a lot of fitting, like a ring either fits you or it doesn't. But a bracelet, you know, you could do the squish, you could kind of expand it a little bit. Um, you know, they work for men and women. Um, so they're, they're really a good item 
Um, and again, you know, if you, you give it to someone in your family and you haven't seen them for a while, you don't know their size, there's kind of a size range you can fudge. So, um, yeah, so bracelets are really good for that. Um, there are two different kinds. There's a bangle, and a bangle is a solid circle, and it fits over your hand and just kind of hangs there. And then the second kind that we're going to make tonight is a cuff bracelet. And a cuff bracelet has the opening at the bottom. And um, they're really comfortable. And again, they, they, um, you know, they fit very well. So the cuff bracelet, the file bracelet we're making today, um, uh, the one I'm demoing on is in silver. You could make your bracelet out of silver, out of copper, out of brass, out of gold, if you have a lot of money. Um, and if you don't have a lot of money, copper is a good choice, but when you buy from the jewelry suppliers, you know, silver doesn't cost as much as you might uh, think it does. And this bracelet takes a fair amount of time. So it's kind of nice to make it in silver to kind of honor all that labor that you're, you're putting into it. And um, there are many different um, sizes and shapes. Of, of copper and silver that you can use. And this is round wire that I got from Pacific Recycling. It came out of the scrap bin. And I want you to just see, first of all, how stiff this is. It just doesn't want to move. So hold that thought, because that's going to be important in a little bit here. Um, this is some silver that is triangular in cross section. I don't know if you can see this, but um, it makes for a, a very dramatic bold bracelet. This is one that I'm in the process of working on with some little filed notches in it. So you can make your, your bracelet out of square, out of round, out of triangle. You could make it out of an assortment of materials. The bracelet we're making today, um, we're using a six gauge square stock and the thing is if you make your bracelet your filed bracelet out of something that's too thin you don't have any room to really file and be expressive with it so um that's why it's going to um be made out of this heavier stock instead and i'll show you some examples of this of what we're making the idea is to make this sculptural and you don't need a lot of tools for it. And that's one of the fun things about this. Um, so this is a copper bracelet that's filed and it has a patina on it. And we'll actually talk about the patina later on tonight. And the nice thing about the patina is that it brings out the pattern because it rubs off of the high spots. You rub it off if you didn't, it would come off naturally and then it stays in the low spots and I've got bracelets on right now that I patinaed back in 2007 and they're still in the low spots it's still dark in the low spots so it's not like a paint that rubs off it's an actual chemical change within the metal so this is one and then these are two that were done in silver now this one is more of a surface patterned bracelet and you could see that it's got designs on all the sides, including the inside, including the ends. It's not shaped very much. It's more a surface technique. You could take this filing of your bracelets to great extremes. This one has some more, more shape to it, more ups and downs and ins and outs. This is another one that's, you could see we're actually, we removed a lot of metal and we're starting to shape the surface on these. It's not just a, a surface texture that's created with your files. And there are really no, no rules to these and that's what really makes them fun. Um, here's another one I have out of really heavy, super heavy copper. And this thing is really heavy too. And there's just a little tiny bit of embellishment at the top. This time to focus. 
and it also uses some files. So one of the things, um, the tools that we use for this, I'm not going to go over tools all at once right now, but I did, I did make up a tool list and I know that um, anyone who is interested can um, talk to Hector about getting a copy. Um, just let him know you're interested. And on the list, I have um, several different suppliers. Rio Grande is one of the big jewelry suppliers and I did give you um, their contact information. There's a, a phone number you can call. And the other thing is, um, there's another place called Contenti and they have, um, their prices are a little bit better, but um, they also have a full range, but they don't have a lot of metal. So they're on the supply list though, because they have this wonderful product. And if you're going to make this, this bracelet tonight that, you know, that we're doing tonight, you're going to need some things to work off of. This is um, my bench pin. I don't know if you can see it. And we do, jewelers do all their filing and, and um, they're sanding, they're shaping on, or they're sanding and filing and, and polishing and that on these. So we also will need a bracelet mandrel, which is a way to shape your bracelet into a, an oval. And we also, um, sometimes need like a little anvil to work on. So Contenti has this product that I absolutely love and it's not the highest quality steel, so it will take dings and dents pretty quickly, but it's this really heavy um, anvil like top and you attach it to a sturdy table or you can attach it to a bench and you can put, it comes with this ring mandrel, I mean this bracelet mandrel, and it also comes with the ring mandrel. Um, so if you want to make rings, you can put that in. Let me move my camera down a little bit. There we go. So this has all the, the bells and whistles and it also comes with a wooden bench pin and it's pre-cut, pre-shaped because sometimes you have to saw out your own shapes. And this is on sale right now for, I think it was like $45 for all of this stuff. It's um, on cyber sale. It's normally 55, which is still good. So if you want to make this project, I really recommend that uh, if you don't have any equipment, if you're just starting out, this is a great way to start out. It'll get you up and running really fast. And then also on the supply list are some needle files, which you'll see me use, and a rawhide mallet, which you'll see me use. And all of those, um, that's really about all you'll need to make this, this project. So um, we'll get started on this. Um, one of the big things is how do you know how long a piece of metal to cut? And uh, well, that's a, a really good question. If you don't know on the supply list, I have six gauge silver and I say get about a seven inch piece. You can always, take metal off, but you can't put metal back on. So it's better to have it be a little bit bigger. And, you know, people range range in great size. I had a student who had, you know, her husband had wrists like this, I'm not kidding. And then I had a senior citizen who whose wrists were so small, three inches was enough for a bracelet. And usually six is about the standard six to seven. So, you know, there, there's a wide range. If you're making things to sell at a craft fair, I'd probably go with six, six and three quarters, maybe throw in a couple seven inches. So um, when, you, when you do this, another thing you could do is take a bracelet that you already own, if you're making it for yourself or, you know, if you're making it for someone special, you could take their bracelet. And I like to use a cloth tape measure and you could just take it and put it at one end of the bracelet and kind of go up and over. And it will tell you, now this one is quite large. This is almost eight inches. All right, so if this was you know, somebody in my family, I'd know to you know, get a longer blank. 
And the other thing you want to do is you have to figure in the opening. And that's always, um, that's always a question because if you just measure a tape measure around your wrist and it might show six inches or seven inches, um, you have to allow for that opening. So you wouldn't order six or seven inches, you'd order about an inch less. The opening on your cuff bracelets is usually about an inch. And one way, it's kind of a cool thing, the, the whole body is proportioned to the golden section and everything is proportionate throughout. So if you take your knuckle of your first, you know, of your, your pointer finger, this first knuckle joint corresponds about to the height of your wrist. And so if you make the opening, it's usually just, this is just a tiny bit smaller than the height of your wrist. And so if you make your opening to this size, what happens is it, you'll be able to get it on, but when your hand turns, it won't be so big that your bracelet rotates and falls off. Hey, Karen. And, yes? Someone asked, can you repeat the seller for the bench pin? Um, it's in the supply list that we're going to supply, um, but it's called Contenti, C-O-N-T-E-N-T-I. Okay. Yeah, okay. So Rose was interested in Contenti. Okay. So um, anyway, um, when you're putting a cuff bracelet on and off, there's a little space in your bones right here. You can press in. The worst thing you could do is to get your bracelet on or off is to spring it open and then squish it because that will work hard in it. And we'll talk about work hardening when we talk about annealing. So what you really want to do, and again, if you go to somebody's booth at a craft fair even, don't spring their bracelets, you'll ruin them for them. So you take that, you find that little spot and you hook the end of your bracelet in, you roll in to take it off, you pull on it, let it go into that little squishy spot and you roll out, roll in, roll out. Very, very easy and it will preserve your bracelets. So, all right, so the length minus, yeah, um, the, this and then allow for your opening. Okay, um, let's see. So once you decide how long you want to cut your bracelet blank, you do something called annealing and you, you could get your metal a couple ways. You can, when you start to look, if you get into this and you, you read the metals in the catalog, and it's very confusing at first because they talk about half hard and dead soft. And dead soft means they have pre-annealed the metal and, and annealing is a way to soften it, okay? And when you, um, so when you buy your metal, if you don't have a torch system like I do, what you'll want to do is just buy dead soft all the time. And I almost never buy half hard. I, the only people who really use half hard are wire wrappers because they want that little bit of spring to their, to their metal because they don't um, usually take heat to it. It's all mechanical. So if you, use, um, if you use the half hard and you solder with it or anneal it, you take that temper out of the metal and it becomes dead soft again. So try and buy dead soft and it will save you the annealing step. But I'm going to show it tonight just so that you'll see what it does, you'll understand the term and um, it might make it easier for you when you order metal. Okay, so I think we have a video about that ready to load. When you buy the metal to make your bracelet, you can order it dead soft, and that means the metal is ready to shape. But sometimes you end up having metal that's been around your studio for a while, or you could get it at the recycling center. And that metal is pretty hard. And when you're shaping your bracelet, it doesn't want to bend very well. So we do a process on the metal called annealing. And that's a, a matter of heating the metal and what it does is it rearranges the structure of the metal again. Metal is actually a crystal. 
which we don't think about. We're used to seeing, you know, shiny, sparkly crystals, but metal has a crystal structure and annealing. Um, when you work with your metal, the, that crystal structure gets um, out of shape, we'll just say for, for an easy explanation. And then when you anneal it, um, it puts the chair back in order and that gives the molecules the ability to test each other and move again. If you try and shape your metal without annealing, when it's really, really hardened, work hardened, um, you could actually crack your metal. So this prevents that from happening. So what I'm going to do is get my torch all set up. Um, I have a combination of propane and oxygen. And the torches that we have our students at the academy um, purchase is acetylene air. So it's a one tank system. I have a two tank system. And um, there's a, the system that we have you get is a little less expensive because it's one less tank, one less regulator. So what I'm going to do first of all, before I start is put on my safety glasses. If you never ever used fire without having safety glasses, and these you'll notice have a colored lens to them. It's not a shade five like you would use with welding. This is a shade two. So it's more than your regular sunglasses, but it's less than a, than a welding goggle. And so I have my safety glasses on. And what I'm going to do now is turn on my gas and wipe my torch. Electronic striker here. Always turn your gas on first and you light your gas. And then I'm using oxygen. And what this does is it makes my flame a little hotter. And this is a pretty big a pretty big orifice that I'm using. Now, be before I begin, let me put my torch, the, the, my torch rack here. I have two metals that I'm going to be heating for you. One is silver and one is copper. And if I use the silver, if I don't put a protective fire coat on it, what happens is I'll end up with something called fire scale in your metal. Pretty much when you're all done, you're, you're polished and ready to go, and you'll see these ugly purple blotches on your metal. And that's called fire stain or fire scale. And what happens is you have to sand that off. So if you're almost finished with your piece and you find that, then you have to go back and sand. So putting the, the fire coat, which is a combination of boric acid and alcohol, mixed it up myself, I put on the metal, and it's going to make a little little glass coating. You can see the flames. That's the alcohol burning away. And you will very fine white coating on top of my silver. And what happens is when I heat that, that coating of boric acid melts and it forms a little layer of what they call flux glass. And it keeps the atmospheric oxygen off of my silver prevent that fire scale. Okay, I have two pieces of metal here. The second one is copper, and this did come from the recycler, from the scrapyard, and it does not need the fire coat. And you'll learn about why all of this is necessary and how it works when uh, you, know, you take your classes. So what I'm going to do with a little bit of extra alcohol on the fire brick here that needs to burn off. Let that just go for a minute. Quite a bit extra alcohol on here. Okay. What I'm going to do instead is turn my brick over so I don't have to worry about that right now. The brick I'm using to do my annealing on is a fire brick. And I got this from a pottery supplier. This is what they use to make the walls of a ceramic kiln, pottery kiln. And it's really good to solder on. You could also get these at your local jewelry or your jewelry supplier, such as Real Grande or Contenti or Auto Fry. Okay, I'm ready. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat this metal up to the color of red grapes. And the silver is going to look a little different from the copper, which is why I'm putting an example of each out for you. And I'll do the silver first. And the idea is to get this hot pretty fast. And when you look at the metal, you'll see that it suddenly starts to have kind of a dancing color show going on. And once I know I get that, then my metal is starting to get warm. So I'm trying to heat this whole long piece up evenly, fairly quickly. And then I'm going to work each section because I, can, I can't heat the whole thing at once. And I'm just going to carry my torch down the, down the piece. And I'm going to do this until it turns the color of red grapes. Now, sometimes people, you'll read and it'll say cherry red. Well, I live in an area where there are 50 varieties of cherries and they're all a different color. So that doesn't work for me, but red grapes, we've all had red grapes. You've seen them at the grocery store. And you can see that's the color I'm getting. And take this all the way to the end. If you miss a spot, it's not good because then you'll have a hard spot in your metal. And if you have a hard spot, all your stresses, and you could end up with a crack in that area. Now, I'll need to punch this because you don't ever want to punch silver at red heat, or what will happen is it will crack. So I'm just letting it air cool for a second. Now I'm going to take my punch bowl, my water, and I'm going to let it sit there. Now I'm going to work on the copper. And it will be a an orange metal. The silver is a white metal. It'll look just a little bit different. But that red grape skyline really seems to work well for me. All of this has to do with the internal temperature of the metal. And because we can't put a thermometer on the metal as we're working, metal smiths learn to judge the color and um, in relation to the temperature in relation to the color. That tells us a lot. Right, now we're getting to the red grapes again. And I'm going to take this all the way to the end. It kind of glows from inside. That tells me that I've gone all the way. Now I'm going back over it a second time, opposite direction. Just so that I haven't missed an area. And so now what I'm going to do is punch this. It's a nice bubbly sound. I'll turn off my torch. I was turn off my oxygen first and then my gas. And now I'm going to take these out of the quench bowl and I'm going to put them in my pickle pot. Pickle is an acid solution. And like this, and you don't want to put steel in your pickle pot. So we use copper tongs to get our pieces in and out. And this is hot. And I'm going to leave this for about 10 minutes. <clears throat> it takes longer early in the day before your pickle pot is saturated with heat. And then it takes less time at the end of the day when everything is just really super hot. So maybe at the beginning of the day, it's a 20 minute soak in the pickle. At the end of the day, it might be as little as three to five. And you just learn to judge that as you're working. And what it will do is take all that black coating off the metal that I got from taking the torch to it. So, and I used a regular crock pot from a thrift store and that um, you can get at the jewelry suppliers. 
and then some people who are going green use citric acid, and that works very well too. Um, although it does tend to get moldy, so you have to change it a little more frequently. And uh, again, that just cleans your metal right off. So that is how we softened our metal. And then we'll talk about how to shape your metal for your bracelet when we come back. Okay, we're back. So um, if you have questions, of course, you put them in the chat and we'll get to them as, as we go. Um, so once you anneal your metal and it's soft, you remember that piece that I had that I said was from the, um, from the recycle. So this is that annealed piece that I had and it's all nice and shiny clean again. And I can bend this with my hands now. That is a big, thick piece of metal, and I can do that. And I couldn't before, before I hit annealed. And so it's amazing how soft it can make your metal. It's almost like cardboard. Um, and I know in a lot of, a lot of cultures, the the metalsmiths are almost feared and revered because they know all these things about metal because metal is so hard and so cold. And the metalsmiths know how to manipulate it and make it soft and make it beautiful. And so there's a certain mystique around that, that, um, that job class, that working class uh, of the metalsmiths. So it's kind of a cool thing. We actually talk a lot about jewelry history and jewelry and world cultures and that in, in our program, because you really are part of this this wonderful long tradition of, um, of working with metal. So the next thing I need to do is shape this straight piece into a hand shape and a, a wrist shape. And if you look at your wrist, it's not round, okay? It's, it's basically an oval and it's flat on the top and the bottom. And so, they sell round mandrels, and those are good for these bangle bracelets. And then an oval mandrel is good for the um, for the cuff bracelets. And the the number that I gave you for the the contenti ring mandrel is, I mean, bracelet mandrel is uh, for the oval one because it's just a little more practical. So I want to shape this now, and what I'm going to do. I need to shape it before I start to file because when you have one of these file bracelets, you have a lot of thick and thin spots. And what's going to happen is these thin spots will want to bend and the thicker spots will resist. And then it's really hard to get a, a nice, even, beautiful shape on your bracelet. So we shape it first and then we file. And it sounds like, oh, that would be hard, but it's really not. It, it's, your filing is just as easy really on a, on a round piece as it is on a flat piece. So I'm going to take my blank. And this is the other one that I annealed. And I'm gonna move my, okay, can everyone see that? Somebody on the panel? Is this showing up all right? Since I moved my computer, hopefully this is good. So what I'm going to do, I have a vise and I have my vise in an old tree stump and it's bolted down onto this. And um, I put my mandrel in my vise. I also have my contenti one, but I, this is the one I use in my studio more often. And what you want to do, you're going to use a rawhide Mallet, it's a leather mallet. A uh, mallet is something that's not metal and a hammer is something that's metal. So this is a rawhide mallet. And when you, when you want this, the shape, you know, your, your idea may be, I put my metal on and then I go all the way around, but that really doesn't shape your metal. What you end up doing is you find kind of the sweet spot on the mandrel and I start oh, about three quarters of the way in from, I mean, yeah, three quarters of the way from the center. And 
my hand is going to be like a machine with the with the mallet. I'm not going to move it all around the mandrel. I'm just going to hold it in one place and I'm going to pull my bracelet blank. And then I'm going to flip it and I'm going to do the same on this side. Now, this is a fairly narrow piece. If I had a wider piece of metal, I'd have to be careful because this mandrel is not a straight tube, it's shaped like a cone. So if I had a wide, wide bracelet like this one that I showed you, I would end up with it having a funny cone shape. So in that case, what I would do is turn to this side now, to the opposite side. I think I'm still showing up. And then I would have to do the same thing again, do each side. And that would kind of even out the, the angle that gets formed in the bracelet. And I started off a little wide on this. So I'm going to work a little closer to this end now. You can see this is just forming so, so easily because again, I annealed my metal and uh, we'll go from there. Now this is kind of a long blank. And if you've decided, oh, it's too narrow here, I wanna widen it. You just move it up to the wider spot on the mandrel. And the idea is to get both of those curves the same size and the same shape. And then the other thing you want to do is have it so that the and I'll show it on this one so I don't spend more time shaping. Um, you want to have the center of the bottom opening aligned with the center of the top. This one needs a little bit more shaping to get there. You can see it's just a little bit off to the off to this side. That center, it's not quite lined up. So it means I need to kind of hit it right here and bring this in. In a little more. Let me just do that real quick. So that's what you will use your fancy bracelet mandrel for. And that took care of it. I just hit it up at the shoulders and I'm much closer in shape now. And I could fuss with this a little bit more, but you get the idea. And now it's just a matter of, of spending time getting it. Just right. One more spot here. Okay, so once you get your bracelet shaped, then you need to think about your design that you want to file. And you could do this several ways. You could pre-plan your design and you know really know exactly what you want. Did I, okay. Um, and if you do that, you could mark on your metal with a Sharpie and you know, you can decide that, oh, I want, you know, three little lines here, and maybe I want a square here, and you can kind of look at it. You could also do this on paper first, okay? And another way to do it is to just kind of relax and have fun with it, and just kind of be spontaneous with your design. Um, either way works. It's just sometimes we have a different... Um, we have a different mindset and some people really like order and control and some people just love to wing it. So either way, it, it no right, no wrong. Um, but there are a couple of things you wanna keep in mind. Um, if you're using the square stock, it has six sides. We're used to just seeing things decorated on the top, but it's more fun when you treat this as a sculpture and you pay attention to one, two, three, four, five and six are the ends, right here and right here. People love it when there's something unexpected and putting designs on the inside of your bracelet really adds a lot of kind of a sense of delight sometimes people will feel. Um, you have a secret, only you know what's inside that bracelet and nobody else does. And that's kind of a powerful psychological um, device. 
and sometimes people will buy your piece just because you tuck a secret in on the inside or on the um, back of a pendant or whatever. So, you know, jewelry classes are not just about the technical skills. Um, I know in the GEM program, we really try and get you to think about jewelry and think more deeply about jewelry and all it has to offer and the way it, it does work with the psyche and things that you want to say and express. So this is just one of those little things. It's a little thing that's really a big thing. So keep that in mind when you're working. And uh, there was a, a Native American jeweler, a Hopi, uh, named Charles Lolima. And he is the one who really transformed the, pa the face of Native American jewelry. And um, he conducted Kiva ceremonies and he ran with the jet set in Monaco. You know, he had a foot in both worlds and made this fabulous, fabulous work. And back in the 70s, when I was newly engaged, we were looking at wedding rings and he had a series of wedding rings that were just plain, plain gold bands on the outside. And the inside was just filled with the most gorgeous inlay with lapis and coral and mother of pearl and turquoise. And again, you had a secret, you had a surprise. And I remember reading more about him and reading about his philosophy. And that really has influenced how I make my own work. I always try and put a secret in somewhere. So, so for, from a design point of view, forget the secret, just from a design, consider all your surfaces. It makes it more interesting, if nothing else. There are very few rules. Um, asymmetry is really appealing. It gives your eye more places to engage. It keeps your mind going. It lets you think a little bit about what you're seeing. It's almost like a like an echo game. You know, I see this motif here and oh look, I see it here again. And I see it almost almost that motif, but maybe a variation on it over here. And so again, it 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 keeps your mind going. If something is very simple and very symmetrical, your eye sees it, it registers it, and then you're done. You move on. But something like this, where, where it's theme and variation, repetition, variation, those good principles of design, you build those into your piece, and it makes for a much more engaging piece that really stands the test of time. You don't get bored with it so much. So think about that when you're designing. And then um, there are just two rules that you do have to keep in mind. One is make sure that your ends are not sharp because when you do that roll in and roll out, if your ends are sharp, you could get in really big trouble. And then the other rule is that when you're filing, you don't wanna go deeper than, you don't wanna remove more than 50% of the metal total. So it could be cumulative, like this little section I worked on has top and bottom and both sides removed. So what remains needs to be 50% left. Um, if I just go digging in, like I did in a couple places here, again, if it's if it goes deeper than 50%, it's a weak spot. And even though you're rolling in and rolling out when you put this on, there's still a little bit of flex, and it's going to work hard in that spot. And because it's thin, it'll it'll take, it'll accumulate those stresses there. And then one day you'll you'll put it on and it will just snap on you. So keep that 50% in mind your only two rules on this. And then of course, for your opening, again, it should be just about the size of your knuckle or maybe a little smaller, it depends on who you're making it for. Um, so there we go. So once you decide what you're doing, we're ready to start filing the bracelet. And what I'm going to do is shift my camera to my bench camera. So I'm going to do all my filing off my bench pin. And the tools we use really also have a long history. They're very much unchanged since medieval times or before that. I went to a, an exhibit of, of a, a medieval goldsmith's workshop. They had a bench pin. They had a rudimentary saw frame. Um, they had pliers, very similar to the pliers we use. Uh, it was just really shocking. So you really walk with history when you're a metalsmith. And that's something that just really, I, I, it just makes me happy to think about that. 
All right, I'm going to shift cameras. And there we are. And I'm going to move my light. I need light to work, but you need light to see. So I'll try and find the best of both worlds here. Okay. Oh, there we go. I think that's a good compromise. Okay. So one of the things I have here is a ring. And this is done the same technique that I'm going to do on the bracelet. And I used the files, started off, uh, soldered my ring together and shaped it on the ring mandrel that comes with the contenti set. Otherwise you would buy it separately. And if you're a jewelry student at the Academy in the GEM program, we have a toolkit that we have you buy. But if you already have some of those things, then you don't buy the whole kit. You just kind of fill in what you're, what you're missing. So, all right. So anyway, the, the filed ring is really kind of a fun project also. And one thing is we're working on this that's really an important thing to keep in mind. And this holds true for any tool that you're using when you're a metalsmith. The shape of the tool echoes itself in the metal. So if I want to make a round form, I would use a round file. And these are the files we'll be using. These are little needle files. And they're fairly small. And this is a round file. And this is what I used on this. And you can see it just echoes right in there. And if I wanted a, a wider, softer curve, I would use a half round file instead of a full round. It'll pick up a tight curve or a loose curve. If I want to make a, a flat spot, I would use a flat file. And I have one spot here that fits right into the flat file. It is the exact size. And so that pick, that yeah, that shows it. And this file has teeth on all four sides. So if I use this, it's going to cut the bottom, but it's also going to cut into the sides. And that is what I wanted. So that was the appropriate file. I also have a triangle file. It's triangle in shape. They call it a three square, but it is a triangle. And I use that to make this little shape. Let's see. Is that registering? There we go. You can see it against the dark contrast here. And again, it echoes the shape of that triangle file. And then if you have a skinny spot and you want it to be all square and nice, then I have a four square file, which is a square file. And this will make on end, it will make a nice 90 degree edge. And if I put it flat, it'll make a, a skinny channel instead of a wide channel that's flat with straight size sides. So it's kind of, this is a really good exercise. This project is something we have all our beginning students make. And it's great that you get a bracelet out of it. But the purpose of this is to teach you how to file carefully, purposefully, with intention, and think about the shapes of the files that you're using and really see how you can use them expressively. And so that's what we're going to be doing here for the rest of the evening. And then after I file this, um, then I'm going to sand it and I'll put a patina on and then do some selective removal of the patina and we'll be done. Now, the other thing about this bracelet, um, I don't have a set plan and it's asymmetrical. And so I can kind of look at this and go, yes, my design looks balanced and I think I'm done, but I could also come back to it in six months and say, you know, it'd be fun to put something right here or, hmm, you know, maybe I want to make that, that shape wider. So you could play with this for a long time. When we have our students do it, we give them several weeks for the project because it's also something you don't want to sit and do for eight hours at a stretch. Your eye gets tired. You stop seeing what you're doing. So I always tell them, you know, pick it up and work on it for 10 minutes and then go back to your soldering or your, 
or your, um, you know, your stone setting or whatever you're working on. And then again, take a little break, come back, file again for another 10 minutes. And before you know it, you end up with a, a full bracelet. Okay. So I'm going to continue on this. And while I'm working on this, it will be a good time if anybody has questions. I can't look at the screen. So I think um, Hector or Reed, somebody was going to field questions to me. Yeah, uh, questions out there, uh, students, any questions out there we can send over, please do. I did have a question uh, earlier that I saved. I was okay. sad. Um, and one of the things that he was just talking about overall was really just, I think the essence of it was really just more of like, can I get paid in this industry? Is this something that I can make a living off of? And, I, and he, I, he worded it differently, but I'm pretty sure the essence of what he was asking was really more about career opportunities. Is this something I can actually make a living off of doing? And uh, the answer is yes. There are so many different niches. Um, there are people who just set stones all day. And back when I was a student, my teacher was telling me about that. And that was back in, when was that? The, the late 80s, early 90s. And the stone setting person was making $50 an hour way back then. And all he did all day was set stones, but man, he earned a living. Um, my teacher put three children through college on his goldsmith's salary. He did custom work for a small jeweler in the small town I lived in. And um, he did custom designs, he did repair, he did stone setting. And uh, he really, his work was so beautiful, so carefully crafted, so beautifully designed. And again, he was in demand. If you had a Tony Asa ring, you were somebody. And again, he fed his family on that. And then some, because college is not cheap. So there's that. Um, there are bigger industries. There's um, you know places like Tiffany's and you know they employ goldsmiths and bench jewelers. Our program covers the cutting edge as well as the traditional bench skills. So we teach um, 3D design and um, 3D, you know, um, um, 3D printing. And we also teach laser cutting and milling. So you could work in those, those avenues. Um, people design things on the computer and then they send it out to be, um, to have a wax cut and cast or sometimes they'll, they'll just have a prototype made and you can cast directly from that more plastic based prototype. Um, so the manufacturing industry has a lot of, of positions. Um, some people just work as independent studio jewelers. One of my former students is doing that and she just went wholesale. And once she went wholesale, she really started to make the money because it wasn't something on consignment. You know, she had contracts that she had to fill and, uh, but what's the bottom line on all of that if you're working as an independent studio jeweler is having a voice because there is a lot of jewelry out there. And I, you know, you look at a place like Etsy and it's almost depressing because there's, there's almost a sameness to everything. And one thing that we do in our program is that we stress concept and your voice as much as we stress learning the technical skills. So all our technique is in service to concept instead of the other way around. And by having a, a strong concept, which translates then to a, you know, a more unusual design and something that's got a little more heart and soul, um, you know, you can do quite well. Other graduates of ours, um, they've set up, you know, small manufacturing businesses. Um, I know there was a, 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 a duo and I think they were called their birds and bones and they did a lot of um, cast pieces based on bird skulls and they've done quite well. Um, another one of our graduates was working for Tiffany's in their 
high-end sales. And because she knew jewelry making from the ground up, you know, she was really able to, you know, sell the product and, uh, and that. So, yeah, so many opportunities, just so many. And the other thing is, oh, we're right now, they just did a paper on this at the Santa Fe Symposium um, last year, I think it was, or the year before. Right now, so many of the current generation of jewelers are nearing retirement age, and they're having a hard time finding replacements because this is such a specialized skill and people are so busy and, and that. So they, they interviewed us because of our online program because that's another thing that you know you may a jeweler may hire you as a sales associate and then you know maybe you're going to school online in your off hours and then you end up becoming their bench jeweler because the bench jeweler that's been with their firm for you know 45 years is about to retire so again lots of different opportunities so i hope that answers the question uh, Karen, another question from Robert out there. If you're in the undergraduate program in jewelry metal arts, do you mm -hmm. like to cast on your own wax models? Are you allowed to? Or do we learn or teach how to cast on people's own Could wax? Could you repeat that question? On our own? Um, so we don't teach it per se, simply because we have a lot of online students who live in you know one room studio apartments and if they had big fire you saw my annealing flame well your casting flame is you know twice that size and lots of equipment and and uh you know all our students aren't all able to do it in online so we don't build that into the curriculum we do talk about it but we can't teach it but if you take the on-site on classes, then you actually do your own casting. You do your own pours. Robert, did that help? Now, if you have a way to do your own casting, your teacher is not going to say, don't do it. Because I got my MFA online, and I was actually teaching in a professional goldsmithing program at a community college at that time. And what I did was I cast my own pieces and everybody else in the class was sending theirs out. But it was absolutely fine because I did have access to the facility. Plus I also had a casting set up in my garage. So they didn't penalize me for doing my own casting, but I already knew how to do that when I went in. And again, it's just the logistics of the program. So I'm filing a notch into this right now because I have this, this full, full round, smaller rectangle where I've, I've carved out all the sides and I'm looking at this going, oh, the balance needs something here. We need to echo that shape again as part of the design. So I'm doing that. When you file on this bracelet, you don't want to file fast because your file will slip. So you want to file with control. And you always want to file against your bench pin. If you file in the air, it's called air filing. And it's a bad thing because you don't have control. And your whole arm, you know, your socket moves through 360 degrees. And it's also a big shock absorber. So one, my everything's going to wobble on me. And then the other thing is uh, that um, I want all the force to go between the file and the metal. And this big shock absorber of my muscles is taking a lot of that force off. So I'm just not getting as much physical work done on my filing because you know, filing is it's actually hard physical work. So by doing it this way and bracing against my bench pin, all that effort is going right where I want it to go. So are there more questions? No ex no other questions have come in so far. So I'm keeping an eye on the chat right this second. Um, okay. 
question for you, as far as your design goes, what's making you choose to file those particular parts? Is it aesthetics? Is it for function? Is it for balance? So in this case, this is um, aesthetics and it's kind of interesting. So Charlene Modena, our program director, her work is very organic and very loose and absolutely gorgeous. And my work is very tight and very geometric. And, you know, it's just um, these bracelets are as in individual as you are. All your metal work is as individual as you are, unless you're copying from Etsy, which you really shouldn't do. And so I like geometry and I don't know if this is going to show up on this camera or not the way the lighting is, but I have these little tiny um, triangles and these little pyramid shapes. And let's see, can I get that? Is that showing? So I love to, I put these focus in. focus right there. Right up higher, for higher, lower. Up there. Probably a little lower. So I have four sides that a little lower. I think it shows better on the big camera. But uh, anyway, it's a signature shape that I put into all my filed bracelets. And uh, it's just something I like to do. So for those, I use my triangle file and I go on one side, then the other, and then I go up and then I go up the other side. And I end up, if you look down on it, it's a little four square pyramid. And uh, I am going for asymmetry here. And one of the things is I'm planning the design is I'm, I'm kind of working as I go. And I'll feel like, oh, this area, you know, there's nothing interesting going on. And so I need to add some interest to it. And then I will also say, you know, you know, it feels off balance or, you know, so I need to, to counter the heavy side that's got a lot of fussy detail with a little bit of detail on this side. So. And then of course, again, your ends should not be the, a, a motif that's very sharp because that will physically hurt. And that's one way that jewelry is different from say sculpture, because there was a period in the 70s and early 80s when you know jewelry as sculpture was a big thing. And it can be very sculptural. This bracelet is very sculptural, but it's not sculpture because jewelry always relates in some way to the body. And there's a lot of conceptual jewelry out there that's not comfortable to wear, um, that's challenging to wear, that's challenging to look at. And that's part of the concept of that jewelry. But if you're making jewelry for everyday folks to wear, then it needs to be comfortable. It shouldn't poke. Your necklaces shouldn't flip on you. Um, they shouldn't tug at your neck, they shouldn't, the chain shouldn't catch in your hair. And uh, so those are all considerations. So even the most sculptural, sculptural of jewelry, if it is going to be deemed wearable, it needs to take into account how it relates to the body. So. So other than bracelet, what are some of the other um, art pieces that you tend to work on yourself? You cut out for the first part of that. I heard about art pieces. I said, other than bracelets. Could you repeat the question? Other than bracelets, what okay. other types of art pieces do you work on yourself? For jewelry, I make a lot of um, a lot of necklaces, and I don't do a lot of just a a small pendant on a chain cut type pieces. Um, again, I tend to do things that have oh you know, messages um, and hidden parts to them. Um, let's see, I make a lot of um, earrings and those are more for my commercial line. But when I'm working on pieces just for me, um, I, tend, I make a lot of boxes. My, my graduate thesis was all about, you know, containers and cabinets. And even to this day, that has continued to fascinate me. It's a theme that I just visit again and again and again. 
And right now I'm working on a series where the outside of the box is totally sterile, totally plain, and then the inside has interest in it. And only you can see it because the top is open. So your bird's eye view, the bird's eye view of the wearer gets all the delight of what's inside. But people that are just looking at them think they're wearing a, a re plain old rectangular box that's very minimalist. And a lot of that relates to our sense of personal space that we have now. You know, people walk down the street with their iPods on and they're they're listening to the music and nobody else participates in that. So it's a little bit of a comment on that, as well as again going back to my love of having a secret and nobody else knows what the secret is. You know, also, I've been to several of the student fashion shows uh, in San Francisco and in New York, and I've noticed that a lot of the jewelry that is appears in the show is made by the students from the Jewelry Metal Arts program. Um, can you speak to that at all as far as any of the collaborations with the fashion department? So those are usually the on-site students. And I don't know if we're continuing to design with fashion, but I know that we have also had some collaborations with fashion styling. And in fact, in the, the 2020 spring show, there was a, um, there were several really, really dramatic pieces and the models, you know, their makeup and their hair and everything really worked to show off those pieces. Um, if you go to the spring show and look under collaboration, and then you'll see someone wearing a great big necklace and you'll know you're at the spot. Um, so yeah, that's that's one thing. And I know one of our, our instructors, Lindsay Eason, who teaches online, did a fabulous, um, when she was a student in the program, she did a fabulous dress that had these big copper and kind of leaf-like, pod-like shapes attached to it. Absolutely fabulous dress. So, uh, yeah. So one thing we stress in our program is um, what we call contemporary outcomes. So our techniques are very traditional, but we combine them with that which is not necessarily stylish, because that's that's a whole other discussion about you know the fashion world and and you know how you fit into that and you know we do prepare our students for that if that's the direction they want to go but we really have them think in a, a contemporary way so you know the old you know string of pearls around your neck or the little tiny pendant um you know once you graduate if that's what you really want to do then you know we can't tell you not to but we really try and have you think again more deeply about jewelry and think about jewelry's role and then you could take some of those more contemporary concepts and then you can scale them back for the everyday wearable and they're still incredibly interesting but it's not the jewelry you see you know in every catalog in every web store and every page in etsy so it's just a mindset and that's something you know people you know, look at YouTube or whatever, and they say, oh, you know, I don't need to go to school. I can, I can learn to solder on my own, or I can learn to saw, I can learn to file. And yes, but what we do is also try and get you to think differently. And that's something that is very hard to learn on your own. Um, we really get you to think about what jewelry is, why jewelry, why are you using the materials you're using, what are you trying to say with your pieces and how do they reflect you at, at you know, who you are? Um, we don't want everyone's piece in a class to look the same and they don't. And uh, that's really, truly one of the big strengths of our program because everybody comes out, you know, speaking their own voice and having discovered their own voice. Because if you just get all your inspiration off of jewelry that's already been made, your jewelry is always only going to be second best because somebody had that idea before you and you're just copying it. And 
why bother? Why are you even doing that? So uh, by thinking in a more contemporary manner and creating pieces that are bold and interesting, it's just it just brings a lot more to the table, to the cultural table. And that can translate into sales. Karen, so how do you encourage the students to be unique? And what kind of freedom do you encourage them to have when they're coming up with their own ideas for pieces? So that's a really, really good question. So one of the things we really encourage is keeping a journal, a, you know, a sketchbook is another term for it. We call it a journal because sketchbook is kind of a limiting concept. You think you have to draw in it and you do have to draw in it, but we encourage them to do a lot of research and a lot of historical research and a lot of research that has nothing to do with the jewelry world. You know, we want you to put in pictures of, you know, rocks and shells and, um, you know, collapsed, um, collapsed buildings and, you know, something that may appeal to you just because of its texture or its color or its shape. And all of that kind of feeds into your unconscious when you do it. And it ends up kind of reinforcing your ideas and it ends up coming out as a unique piece. And again, because everyone is so different, you know, their journals end up looking different. And, uh, you know, that research is just, it's just so, so, so important. Because again, it helps you develop that concept. Um, again, if you put a bunch of pictures of pre-made jewelry in your sketchbook, well, those are somebody else's ideas. So it's the raw stuff that artists work from. And it is that inspiration in nature, the world around them, um, and not even just visual things. You know, we encourage you to put in, you know, poems or snatches of conversation that you've heard. Um, I remember saving a headline that I, I never even read the story, but it was called The Mathematics of Love and Lust. And I thought, what is that? That's, you know, fascinating just as a statement. And I ripped the headline out of the, out of that newspaper and stuck it in my sketchbook. And I still haven't done anything with it, but it's still floating back there. And uh, who knows, you know, it might turn into something someday. So yeah, those journals are absolutely wonderful resources. And we have everything that we, um, that you put in your sketchbook. It's not a scrapbook. You don't just put in a, a pretty picture. You need to talk about what it is. If you do have a picture of somebody's work, you need to annotate the, you know, caption it with the artist and the title and the materials and the year and where you got it and why you chose it. Because the other thing is if you just stick a bunch of pictures in your book without thought, they're not gonna form those brain pathways that really get you thinking deeply. So you want, we want you to spend a little time with those images and have you think about why they appeal to you. And that's the other reason why we encourage paper sketchbooks because there's actually something in the physical process of finding an image and you know printing it out, cutting it out and pasting it in the book and then physically taking you know a pen or a pencil and writing about it. It it actually builds neural pathways in your in your brain. I have a friend who did a lot of work with brain science and we used to have a lot of talks about this and how important those kinds of things are. So if you just pull pictures off the internet and you keep them in a virtual file, you're not gonna get as much out of it. And my really good friend is a graphic designer. And when she took one of my classes, when I taught at a different school and I made her keep a paper sketchbook and oh my goodness, she fought me tooth and nail. And she's now on probably her 20th sketchbook. She just loves keeping her, her visual journals. And she makes very interesting work beyond just graphic design.
chat out there said you're you're good at this ma'am and robert had a question saying since design is a critical skill in jewelry and metal arts how many sketching classes are taught sketching classes because everyone um unless you place out of it you um everybody takes a drawing class and we kind of build the the design skills into your classes um there it's not a separate thing so much i mean there are design foundation classes that you can take but a lot of times well you know in all our classes we discuss that all the time you know you don't just post your work your teacher critiques it we encourage the other students to offer feedback on your pieces and you know as as an instructor i'll look at your piece and i'll say well you know your design is derivative or it's too safe you've stopped too soon you know how can you deepen your your design let's talk about it and we try and set up a dialogue with our students where we kind of teach those design principles you know as we go like i when i critique work or you know even if you're sending in progress shots I don't just say nice job. I say, um, you know, I like the way you used, um, you know, rhythm. I like your use of asymmetrical balance, and I'll put little tags on my on my um, on their photos that they upload, and um, you know, put a comment in about, you know, this is where the asymmetrical balance is, and you know, it's very successful because it draws my eye here. So yeah, so all of those things are just such an organic part of our program. If that helps. Yeah, thank you so much. I also just put a link uh, for you, Robert, or anybody that wants to check it out. When you go in and click on that, it'll take you right to the degree breakdown for the BFA degree. And you can actually read all the course descriptions um, for each semester. In the first semester, we uh, always encourage students to take sketching for communication. Uh, that's actually going to be focusing on uh, perspective and scaling, et cetera, et cetera. So it's it's definitely a drawing course to help you to get started. Um, but go ahead and click on that link. It'll take you right to the degree breakdown. So you can see not just the sketching courses, but all the courses related to the program. Mm -hmm. Another course that's really interesting, it was one of my favorite classes in grad school and it's taught graduate and undergraduate is sacred geometry. And it talks about, um, there's a lot of design in that. And it's based again on, on proportion and number and the meanings behind it. So it's kind of a nice combination of, of um, pleasing design and concept rolled into one. And I know one of our undergrads who I have seen his name in the chat pod tonight um, is taking it now at my suggestion and he is absolutely loving the class. So that's something you could take as an elective. And it's a different approach to design and a very good one. And someone said, I think you said, someone said I was good at what I do. Yeah, um, shout out I was the person who made every mistake I made every mistake you could possibly make in my classes when I was first learning this. I mean, if there was a way to screw something up, I was the person who did it. And this did not come quick and easy and naturally to me. Um, you know, soldering was so hard. And my first pair of earrings that had four set cabochons, which now you get like a week to do in our programs, it took me a month to make these earrings. Um, you know, making a ring was traumatic for me. And I got good because I was, I cared and I was persistent and I was not going to let this thing beat me. And I remember I, I took my first jewelry class and I walked into the studio room and I looked at all the equipment and I thought, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? Went through the class, got done with the class, walked to my car and sat in my car and cried in the parking lot for an hour because I was so terrified and I never would have seen myself 
going on to get an MFA and then, you know, teaching in a university. So just stick with it. If it's hard, that's good. If it drives you crazy, it means you care. You know, Karen, one thing I wanted to see if I could ask you was, you know, when I do these workshops, a lot of times students are worried about not having experience before getting into a program like this. Uh, any chance you could speak a little yes. bit? Maybe some of those students that have no experience, no background whatsoever in this. Yes. They're interested. That, that is like my favorite question to answer. How did you know that? So this is the thing about art. Everybody, people are weird about art. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. And they think that art is like some mystical thing. And either you have it or you don't. And there's no in between. And so people won't take an art class because they don't know things about art. They don't know how to make, they don't know about color or proportion. Okay, would you ever take a math class and, or say, I can't take trigonometry. I never took trigonometry, but let's just say, I can't take this class because I know nothing about graphs and cosines and whatever the other trigonometry things are. Um, I don't understand math, so I can't take a math class. No, you walk in without a clue and you're there because you want to learn and they teach you how to do math and they teach you how to, you know, what all these equations are about and why you do them and how you do them. And art is really no different. You know, art is, there's been a lot of hype and hoopla around it. A lot of it is problem solving. A lot of it is just learning how to see. The first class I took at the academy was Ecrché, where you made the human figure. You made the entire skeleton. And you did all the bones, one-eighth inch tolerance, which those of you in jewelry know is a huge tolerance, because um, we go to like a tenth of a millimeter. Um, and then you put muscles on half the skeleton. And I had never done figure sculpture before. And again, I was just, you know, terrified and we took it step by step and every week you made a different part of the skeleton you know you worked on the head or the chest first thing you did was just rough it in and get the sh the direction of the 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 motion of the body and then you you know you made the head or you made the the left arm and the right arm and and that and you know very step by step we we learned and I still have my Ecrché figure and I'm really proud of it. And I worked super hard in that class because this was new and different to me. And I got myself an A in that class because anytime the professor said this isn't right, I fixed it. I didn't just, you know, walk away from that. I read his comments. I found out what I, what I needed to do and I fixed it and I learned. And that's what art is. You just, you learn these elements and principles, you learn how to apply them. And of course, in jewelry, there's a lot of technical skill. There's a lot of science, a lot of physics, um, but it's all kind of naturally put in. And you combine that with, you know, again, the elements and principles of design and some color theory. And, you know, you work hard and you, you read and you research and, before you know it, you're doing it. And it's no different, again, from learning how to multiply or divide. So don't be afraid if, if this is new to you, if you wanna do it, the secret is you just do it and you just work really hard. Maybe you have to work a little harder than somebody for whom it comes naturally, but you're also gonna come into this with a fresh perspective, a fresh point of view and your work may end up being much more interesting than that of the person who really knows how to do this. All right. And hey, Karen, yeah. I just want to be mindful of the time. Uh, I know we can keep going for a little bit here. I know that mm -hmm. um, one thing I was going to ask you too was, um, are there any tips that maybe you might have um, as it pertains to like health and safety, I mean, this looks like something that could really, uh, 
you know, put a, put some wear and tear on the strength of your hands and body and stuff. Are there certain techniques that you use in order to try to stay, um, I don't know, just to stay healthy, feel like you 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 have the the strength and endurance for these types of projects? Oh yeah, that's a that's another really good question. Um, ergonomics are so important. If if you saw my bench, it's much higher than a desk, than a table. Uh, it's probably a good, ooh, you know, six six inches higher than a than a regular desk or table. And my chair is low. When I stretch my arm out, it basically lands on the top of my bench. So I'm sitting up straight and I'm sitting with my feet on the floor. I don't have my legs crossed. And all of the, those ergonomics are built in so that I've spent, I literally spent 24 hours sometimes at my bench. If I've got a deadline, you know, I will just power through and work until it's done. And if you, by having this be so ergonomic, you still feel like a human being at the end of that 24 hours, you're actually able to stand up. Um, another thing I do is I look out the window every so often, because you're doing a lot of close focus. And so you need to give your eyes a break and look at far things for a while. You need to, you know, get up and walk across the room just to stretch your muscles from time to time. Um, you always wear safety glasses. If you're doing anything with, you know, a hammer or a torch or even sawing, because if your saw blade breaks, it can land in your eye. Um, if you're polishing, if you're using a flex shaft, you have your safety goggles, you have um, a mask, a, a N95 dust mask um, rated for silica whenever you do polishing. So you're not breathing in all the, the scary stuff. Um, you have ventilation in your studio um, and they sell different, you know, ventilation systems and, you know, where people design them. And, uh, you know, so we, we really are always thinking about the safety issues all the time. It's, it's really, really important. So, yeah, because we're in this for the long haul. So you can see the, the process of doing this bracelet. It's just a lot of, you know, careful, slow filing. And it takes some time, which, as I said, you know, you don't want to sit here and just do this in one shot. You kind of dip in and out of the project. So I've got a couple of these on my bench, um, you know, that I work on and then I'll go back to my other project. So, um, you know, and this piece is done when you say it's done. And I'm looking at the sides. I need, you know, my sides are starting to look interesting. My top has an asymmetrical balance until I put that notch in just now. It didn't feel balanced. It's starting to feel more balanced. Um, the inside has a couple secret spots. I'll need to pay more attention to that. And then there will be a point where I say this feels good and I know I'll be done. I also want to make these ends. I'll probably put those little um, pyramid shapes on the ends. I like to put those there because and I polish them so that they're slightly rounded so they don't cut your, your skin. So after you work on a bracelet like this, um, what you want to do is um, you take your sandpaper and you get rid of any of the imperfections in your surface. And uh, where is this one? Here it is. So you'll come in and you decide what kind of a finish you want on your bracelet. And most people who work in silver and copper, um, they don't usually put a super shiny finish on. We want you to do it in school because we want you to know how to do that. But because silver and copper are such soft metals, um, a brushed finish, a satin finish is a much um, more practical surface to put on your piece. So I like to come in and I'll use my sandpaper to get rid of any scratches and I'll use different grits. And for those of you who are new to this, we use the black sandpaper, it's a silicon carbide and the brown sandpaper is for wood and it's very um, irregular. And this is, um, it comes down to a, 
a more regular surface and it cuts better and it goes um, from a fairly coarse to a very, very fine grit. You can get them in different grits. And so you start with the coarser grit and you work your way down to finer and finer. And you could just leave your piece at a sanded finish if you want. And another thing I like to use on my pieces is a green scotch bright. Is this backwards? It's backwards on my camera. Okay. No, we see it the right way. So um, anyway, it's these, the, okay. It's really weird on my camera, very strange. So it's just, you know, your typical kitchen um, scrubby pad. And I usually cut these down because I don't use big, big pieces of this. And this makes a really, really nice, after I sand, I sand first, and then I'll go back in after I've sanded and I'll put this on. They really conform to the shape of your metal nicely. And they put in this really clean brushed finish. It's slightly directional if you go, and go like this. If you have a surface that's more irregular, you could do kind of a swirly non-directional surface. You just kind of let your piece dictate. And you'll see it start, it'll bring up a shine on your piece, but it's a soft shine. Because again, if I put a mirror finish on this, it would end up lasting me probably all of 10 minutes. And then there'd be little hairline scratches starting to show up. So I like to put these brush, brushed finishes on. And then after you do that, the next thing we do is put a patina on our piece. And what that will do is emphasize your pattern. So we use something, um, there are many different patinas and patina is really an art as much as a science. And we put our piece in this, um, this chemical called liver of sulfur. And let me get my, my little um, bottle of it. You can buy this at the jewelry supplies, it's on a supply list. You can also get a bottle of this at Joann's or Michael's. And it's about $10 for the bottle, but there's always a coupon. So it ends up being five bucks for your bottle. And you mix the solution up with water and you put your piece in and your piece will turn black right away. What I do is I run my piece under as hot of tap water as I can stand. And I get my piece warm as my water's heating up. And then I use super, super hot, but not boiling water to mix my liver. And I use like disposable trays and I'll put the piece in and you mix the liver so that your piece doesn't turn black instantly. If you turn, if it turns black instantly, your solution is too strong. So you need to dilute it a little bit. And after that, um, I put my piece in, I take it out, I rinse it under hot tap water. I put it back in, I count to, you know, maybe 10, take it out, rinse it under hot tap water, and it starts to build up a dark color. And then as the, um, excuse me, um, as this gets darker and darker, you know, when it's pretty uniformly dark, then I stop and I rinse it again. And a lot of students hate liver of sulfur because they take their piece out and they, it looks like this and they leave it at this. And it's really, um, it's a dead surface. So when I say patina is an art as well as a science, once you get this applied, it's going to rub off the high spots anyway. So I like to come in with, oh, again, maybe my scrubby or whatever. Um, and you kind of work it off the high spots. You can use really fine steel wool for this. You can use, um, there's a polishing cloth called the sunshine cloth that Rio Grande wear, um, sells. This is a sunshine cloth. And if I rub my liver of sulfur with this, it turns almost the color of, of hematite. It gives a kind of a, almost a gunmetal silvery color with those warm undertones. It does this on copper and it's a really pretty surface. Um, 
So that's one way you can combine things. So I can use the sunshine cloth and then I can use a little bit of my scrubby and I can pull up highlights this way. And what you end up doing is you, you really build, you know, a richness and a depth to your surface. And if you take off too much, you just throw it back in the liver and re-patina it. And uh, you can take some more off and put it back in the liver. So it's a back and forth process until you're happy with it. Um, if you use steel wool, it gives it almost a slight plum color, an antique plum color. But you see how this is, I don't know if the light is good enough for you to see, but it's starting to, it goes from here's the side that's dead. And look at, we're starting to get highlights. We've got low lights and it really starts to emphasize the form. It creates a sense of shadow and it just makes for a gorgeous rich surface. But if you just plunk it in the liver, and call it good, it's not gonna be good. So it's developing your eye. Again, that Ecroche class that I took, um, I think I forgot to finish that thought. The company that supplied the casts was called Learn to See. And I realized my whole training at the academy was about that really. I learned techniques, but I learned to see, not just look, but to see. And boy, that's like the best thing in the world. And I knew I had gotten there when I had watched a movie and this coach went by, it was about Beethoven. So it was, you know, set a while back and this coach drove by the screen and I didn't see the coach. I saw these beautiful spinning circles with this beautifully, strangely shaped trapezoid between them. And I thought, ah, oh, this is what it is to see as opposed to look and say, oh, coach wheels. I saw the forms. And that was such an exciting moment. And that's what we want to teach you. We want you to learn how to see and learn how to think. So there we go. I'm working on the patina. And again, this will take me to really fully develop this. Um, you know, it could take me an hour. It's not unusual. The finish work sometimes takes longer than it takes to construct the piece. You don't fight it. You just get into it. So that is our bracelet workshop. Thank you so much for all your time tonight. Those things are wonderful. You know, I absolutely love doing this. And, you know, I really want everybody to share in the joy and the fun and, you know, get to do this too. So are you sending, um, are you sending out the supply list if people ask for it? Yeah, I've had people ask for it. I'm going to get it over to everybody when, uh, as soon as I can, as soon as we wrap this up here tonight. So. I know we're out of time here. So um, what I'll do is just ask everybody if you're still around in the chat, looks like there's still about 11 students left. Um, big thank you here to the star of our show, Karen, for taking the time this evening. If you guys don't know, she's ahead of us on the West Coast on time too. So it's a little later. Um, so yeah, hey, Chad, thanks for hanging out and participating tonight with all your questions as well. Uh, but yeah, if we connect afterward, I'll be more than happy to set you guys up with one-on-ones, questions, whatever we need to cover, no problem at all. I mean, we do a lot of legwork after these events to try to help students figure out what the next steps would be if they're looking to pursue this. So, mm -hmm. but a big and I'm always willing to speak to students one-on-one. -on -one. You know, um, the advisors will, or, or the admissions people will set them up and I can tell you all about online specific. Absolutely. I'm gonna go ahead and put a couple and, in the chat. And, uh, really and that, so. Yeah, I was going to put a couple links in the chat here for the okay. students. Uh, one of the links I wanted to put in here uh, for any students out there is one link is to apply to the university. So if anybody out there is considering applying to the university, uh, there's your link to go ahead and do so. I would urge you to reach out to me via email, though. I'd love to try to have a discussion, talk about what your interest is, where you see yourself going, and make sure that we take good care of you going into this, uh, just to make sure the process starts off on the right foot. If there are any students that are out there right now that are currently in high school, anybody is currently a high school student, I would encourage you to check out that link I just dropped, which is the college art experience. We actually teach courses here at the university. Uh, so when students are in high school, they're able to take these courses and they do not have to pay tuition, an application fee, anything. Mm -hmm. The beauty is, is you get good experience. 
But also if you end up choosing to join the academy, those courses actually do count towards scholarship dollars for your, uh, towards your tuition here at the university as well. But really cool things to check out. I do want to remind everybody that we do these events every Tuesday night at the same time, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Here's a link to the upcoming events if you want to check those out. Next week, we're going to be having a behind the scenes with Jan Yanahiro, which is creating a live talent show competition. Uh, and also right now it is animation week. So we're having an industry week. So please feel free to check out any of those events that are going on right now live this week. They're all free for you to check out really cool things. So um, as we wrap it up, one, one more big thank you here uh, to Karen for your time tonight. Thank you so much for everything. We really appreciate you taking the time to show how passionate you are about jewelry metal arts and making bracelets. So thank you all so much. Uh, we'll go ahead and end the recording now. I'll hang back in the chat just for a few more minutes in case there's any last questions or anybody additional links. And uh, we'll go ahead and say good night tonight. We'll see you all next week. Okay. Oh, can I add one more thing? Um, we do have a jewelry rendering course and it's not built for online yet. We're hoping to get that built soon. And um, it is taught on site though. It'll be taught this spring on site and we're hoping to have it built, I think in about a year for online as well. And go to the spring show. There's some beautiful examples of the renderings that were done in that class. And you know, you want to learn how to draw jewelry. That's the place to go. I knew there was something I'd forgotten when I was answering that question. Okay, I'm done talking. <laughs> Perfect. Well, hey, everybody have a great night, okay? All right.